journeys of hope. Life is a journey, and this is your spiritual passport. Where will the journey take us today? Let's walk together as we learn to become people of faith and hope. Welcome to Journeys of Hope. I'm Angela Ciolana, your guide for today's journey, and I serve as media coordinator for Pilgrim Center of Hope, which produces this weekly radio and podcast program. And it is on our grounds that we are recording in St. Joseph's studio. Today's Journey of Hope is going to be a spiritual pilgrimage. You will learn about how wedding imagery, marital imagery, is used by God throughout the Judeo-Christian scriptures, the Bible to demonstrate his love for us. You'll discover the identity of Jesus as the bridegroom. The term bridegroom is not commonly used in our vocabulary today, is it? We only say groom for short. The bridegroom is the groom of the wedding. And to top it all off together, we'll explore all of this as it is expressed and experienced in every Roman Catholic mass so that we can say every Eucharist is a wedding feast. Well, I'm excited to share this with you. This is a subject that I've become more and more excited about as I have grown in my faith and the Lord has just blessed me with opportunities to share it. And every time that I have, it has just blown people away um, to learn about this topic. So let's dive in to our spiritual pilgrimages, shall we? Wedding celebrations are some of the biggest and happiest parties that we can throw. And in many cultures, wedding feasts last for many days. Scripture is completely filled with marital and wedding imagery from the very beginning of the book of Genesis to the very end in the book of Revelation. Let's first look at Genesis when God creates humanity in the divine image and likeness, making us male and female. This first couple has something beautiful, a covenant relationship with God and one another, a covenant in which they agree to care for one another and for all of creation. This is the first marriage, but that marriage is disrupted. Of course, Adam fails to love and and guard his wife and Eve gives into the temptations of our spiritual enemy and passes on that temptation to her husband. So what happens after they betray this covenant with one another and with God? Well, their relationship is, of course, marred. They become ashamed of their own bodies. They hide from God in fear and shame. These are feelings that they had never experienced before in the story. Throughout the scriptures, we can observe this theme of marital covenants between God and humanity, who are especially represented by the Hebrew people. Time and time again, these covenants are made and broken, but God remains faithful in all of them. Sometimes when we think of the Bible, we mostly think of stories like the one of Adam and Eve, for example. The Bible is comprised of many genres, however, not only historical accounts or narratives, but also wisdom literature, such as the Song of Solomon, also called the Song of Songs or Canticles. This entire book is a romantic poem between lovers, and throughout history, the church has interpreted it as the love story of God and his people. Here is one such passage from its fourth chapter. My bride, how much better is your love than wine, and the fragrance of your perfumes than any spice. Your lips drip honey, my bride. Honey and milk are under your tongue, and the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon." Another genre we find in the scriptures is that of prophetic writings, the prophets, which are also filled with marital imagery. I love this passage from Isaiah 62, 5, for example. As a bridegroom rejoices in his bride, so shall God rejoice over you. What is the most striking marital imagery in the prophets? Well, I would say it's probably that of the prophet Hosea, whom God calls to marry a prostitute. Hosea marries a woman named Gomer, who is not faithful to him. This itself is understood to be 
a living prophetic message to the Hebrew people who at the time were betraying their own covenant with God by worshiping the gods of the peoples around them. Gomer leaves Hosea for another man, but God instructs Hosea to redeem her by paying a high price for her return. And this is what happens. Gomer's new so-called lover accepts money to sell her back to Hosea, which tells us that Gomer did not leave Hosea for genuine love, but that she had entered into a mere transactional relationship with this other man. You know, that speaks to us of whatever it is that we prioritize over God. Ultimately, it cannot love us as the one true God loves us. Hosea's is paying of a great price for his bride's return is a foreshadowing of what God will do for his own bride, his people. This saga of marital love in the scriptures, of course, reaches its pinnacle when God becomes man. The people are prepared for his coming by the greatest of prophets, John the Baptist, who describes himself as the best man preparing the way for the bridegroom. John's final testimony to Jesus is recorded as, quote, The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The best man who stands and listens to him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made complete. He must increase. I must decrease. In particular, the gospel attributed to the apostle and evangelist John strongly emphasizes Jesus' position as the bridegroom. Right after Jesus calls his disciples in John chapter 1, John chapter 2 begins with Jesus at a wedding banquet where water contained in six stone jars used for ceremonial washing is turned into wine by Jesus. The evangelist tells us Jesus did this as the beginning of his signs in Cana in Galilee and so revealed his glory and his disciples began to believe in him. Each part of what I just said is significant to understand Jesus's identity as a bridegroom. I'll help you understand what I mean. Before every Jewish wedding, there is a ceremonial washing that takes place. What is interesting, though, is that the wedding of this couple in Cana has already taken place. So we may read the presence of these jars for ceremonial washing as perhaps meaning that there is still another wedding that is going to take place. At Jesus' command, they are filled to the brim with water, the substance used for washing before a wedding. Jesus uses this water as the first of his signs, according to John, and so revealed his glory. This word sign, it doesn't just mean miracle, although it was certainly a miracle that Jesus turned water into wine. But what is meant by a sign? Think even of a street sign. Signs point to something else. This sign means that Jesus is doing something to signal to us who he is. Is he the bridegroom? Well, the head waiter calls to the bridegroom of the wedding at Cana and implies that it is the bridegroom who is responsible for this best of wines. Yet, We do not hear from the groom at all. He is a silent figure in this story. Rather, the next time we will hear about the bridegroom in this gospel account will be John the Baptist's testimony, which I read earlier, identifying Jesus as the bridegroom. We notice that six jars were used in the sign Jesus performed. The number six is significant. Because in John, we do not see another water jar until Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman. Hers is the seventh jar in John's gospel account. Looking at the biblical symbolism of numbers, six is considered a number of incompletion, but seven is a number of fulfillment. So why is this Samaritan woman's jar the jar of fulfillment? 
Well, let's take a look, a journey through that story. When the heat swelters at noon, no one wants to be outside. Still at this time of day, Jesus waits at Jacob's well. No one comes to draw water at the well at noon except the Samaritan woman because she is an outcast. Well, here at Jacob's well, we have Jesus encountering a woman. In the Hebrew scriptures, when a a man meets a woman at a well, we know there will be a wedding. The well is where Moses meets Zipporah, where Abraham's servant meets Isaac's wife, and where Jacob meets Rachel. Defying his cultural customs, Jesus speaks to this woman, not only amazing because she is a woman who is not his relation, but also because she is a Samaritan someone who was not of the Jewish people. And the Jews considered Samaritans as less than in this context. Jesus offers her, this woman, living water. For a Jew, living water is the type of water that is used in a mikveh, the purifying bath before a wedding. Then Jesus speaks to this woman about her husband's. In their dialogue, we are reminded of all the scriptural covenants between God and his people, which were broken by their faithfulness to other gods. The woman responds to Jesus' instruction, go call your husband, by telling him, I do not have a husband. Jesus replies, you are right in saying, I do not have a husband. You have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. And so we are also reminded of Gomer and Hosea. And, ah, the Samaritan woman has had six men, the number of incompletion, but she is dialoguing with a seventh man, Jesus. Seven, the number of fulfillment. Like Hosea, Jesus offers this outcast woman living water, the marriage bath, Jesus shows us that no matter how far outcast someone may be, he still waits for them. He waits for us by the well, and he offers us living water, a water that will purify us before we enter into a covenant with him, the living and true God, a water that will always satisfy us so that we need not look anywhere else for satisfaction. This living water has been identified throughout history as the Holy Spirit. Now, we speak about thirst and satisfying thirst. Remember that for later. We'll come to it. Theologian Dr. Brant Petrie describes one day sitting in church and hearing the following passage from the gospel according to Matthew. The disciples of John approached Jesus and said, Why do we and the Pharisees fast so much, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus answered them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. Dr. Petrie explains, quote, Jesus compares his disciples to the wedding guests, or more literally, the sons of the bride chamber. These were basically the ancient Jewish equivalent of groomsmen, who in ancient as well as modern times weren't exactly known for fasting. Indeed, in rabbinic tradition, both the bridegroom and the sons of the bride chamber were not obligated to perform ordinary religious duties during the seven-day Jewish wedding, including fasting. Jesus is also implicitly identifying the day of his passion and death as his wedding day. He does this by speaking about the coming time when the bridegroom is taken away from them and how they will fast on that day. On one level, this is a reference to the ancient Jewish night of consummation when the bridegroom would leave his family and friends and enter into the bride chamber in order to be united to his bride, not to come out again until morning. Unquote. 
In Jewish tradition, the man and woman are first betrothed for a significant period of time before their marriage is then formalized by negotiation of great price or other contract with the father of the bride. The bride and groom drink from a cup of wine to make a covenant with one another. The groom goes to his father's house to prepare for the bride, to prepare the bridal chamber. After these preparations are made, the bride and groom are escorted to the bridal chamber to consummate their marriage. Afterwards, their marriage is celebrated with a seven days long feast. Looking back at scripture, Franciscan sister Therese Marie Iglesias reflects, quote, Jesus left his father's house to come to the home of his prospective bride, unquote. That is us, humanity. Jesus came to our house, earth, and this mortal realm. Just as in scriptural history, humanity is identified as the bride of God. Sister continues, On Holy Thursday, we remember he shared the cup of the new covenant with his disciples at the Last Supper. In a sense, this was negotiated with his father in the Garden of Gethsemane as he accepted the cup. He told us at the Last Supper, In my father's house, there are many dwelling places. I am going there to prepare a place for you. I will come back and take you to myself so that where I am, you also may be. John fourteen two to three, unquote. So, do you see the great correlation between the Jewish marriage tradition and the actions and words of Jesus? At the Last Supper, he washed his disciples' feet. One could interpret this act as not only a lesson on leadership, but also as a washing of one's bride before the wedding, with his apostles representing the church, his bride. Think of Jesus wearing a crown of thorns. In ancient Judaism, the bridegroom wore a crown, and this tradition continues in many Catholic and Orthodox weddings. Jesus also wore a seamless tunic, as we read in John chapter 19. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. In an ancient Jewish wedding, the bridegroom would dress in a seamless garment because it alluded to the garment of a priest, reminding everyone that marriage is a covenant. If you ever see a piece of sacred art called an icon, which shows Jesus wearing the tunic and the crown of thorns, Now you will know why it is called Christ the Bridegroom. Jesus of Nazareth was crucified. This is a fact which any credible historian will acknowledge. In the Gospel according to John, we hear what we are told is an eyewitness account of what happened after Jesus died from the effects of his torture. Now, since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, They did not break his legs, but one soldier thrust his lance into his side and immediately blood and water flowed out. For a Jewish person who lived during the time of temple sacrifice, when the priest would place the sins of the people on a lamb and then that lamb was offered to God through slaughter, this description of Jesus' death theologically rhymes with John the Baptist's cry as he pointed to Jesus saying, Behold, look, the Lamb of God. Jesus is the Lamb of God who is offered and the atoning sacrifice for sin, and he is the bridegroom, 
who willingly gives of himself in the paying of the highest price for his bride's freedom, as we have heard was foreshadowed by Hosea. So now you can see how St. Paul could instruct Christian husbands to imitate Christ as he wrote to the Ephesians, quote, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and handed himself over for her to sanctify her, cleansing her by the bath of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. So also, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one hates his own flesh, but rather nourishes and cherishes it, even as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, the Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches this, The church is the bride of Christ. He loved her and handed himself over for her. He has purified her by his blood and made her the fruitful mother of all God's children. The Apostle Paul speaks of the whole church and of each of the faithful members of his body as a bride, betrothed to Christ the Lord so as to become but one spirit with him. You know, in Scripture, the book of Revelation reveals the climax of this marital imagery in verses such as Revelation 19.7. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding day of the Lamb has come. His bride has made herself ready. Revelation 21.2 uses the image of the New Jerusalem to represent the people of God as a whole, saying, I also saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And at the end of the book, which is the end of the Bible, the canon of scripture, we find this verse at Revelation 22, 16 through 17. I, Jesus, sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let the hearer say, come. Let the one who thirsts come forward, and the one who wants it receive the gift of life-giving water. What a beautiful way to integrate so many of the images that have been presented to us by God throughout history, the wedding covenant, the bride and the groom, the life-giving marriage bath, the shedding of the lamb's blood, Jesus at the wedding, the Samaritan woman, the consecration of the cup of wine, the piercing of Christ's heart, and the outpouring of blood and water. All of the above is why in the Catholic Church, holy matrimony is a sacrament, A sacrament is a sacred sign instituted by Christ to actively reveal and pour out God's grace and life to the world, which would otherwise be hidden. You know, many of us who are married may not even realize the beauty of this marriage sacrament. Before Christ lived on earth, of course, marriages existed. But in this new age in which we live, the church now believes that God has given us holy matrimony as a sign, a sacrament that points us to the love between Christ, the bridegroom, and the church who is his bride. That's all of us. That's also why the church considers only one particular kind of marriage sacramental, In other words, the sacred sign that reveals the reality of Christ's bridal love for the church. And that is a marriage between a baptized man and a baptized woman who freely give themselves to one another without hindrance, totally and exclusively for life, and are open to the love bearing life into the world through the birth of children. You know, the fact that my marriage is sacramental is a blessing as well as a challenge. I remember once when my husband and I were getting into our car one day and a woman who often sat on her porch nearby at our complex, our apartment complex, called out to my husband. And she told him that she had observed us together over the years and how we had treated one another. 
especially the respect with which he treated me. And it so impressed and moved her that she had to tell us. She had to tell us that our marriage was speaking to her of a love that she thought was admirable, was beautiful, was perhaps something that she had not experienced in her life and the people around her. I know there are many people who have experienced things in their life that have wounded how they see marriage. And if that's you, I hope that this spiritual pilgrimage will help you to find healing and hope. Pope Benedict XVI reflected, Indeed, in the theology of St. Paul, conjugal love is a sacramental sign of Christ's love for his church, a love culminating in the cross, the expression of his marriage with humanity, and at the same time, the origin and heart of the Eucharist. End quote. Well, we've talked about Christ in the scriptures. We've talked about the foreshadowing of Christ in the scriptures. Now we're talking about Christ and about the marriage sacrament. So this all leads us then into the wedding, into the Eucharist. As Saint, um, as Pope Benedict XVI reflected, the, at the same time, the origin and heart of the Eucharist. So my friends, How does the Eucharist, the Mass, express God's love for us as a wedding feast? Get ready. (laughs) Put on your seatbelt. We are going for another journey. Not only now we've gone through all of the scriptures, we're going to go through the Mass. You're listening to Journeys of Hope. I'm Angela Ciolana. And I'm sharing a journey with you through the Catholic Mass about how every Mass is a wedding feast, believe it or not. (laughs) After this break, we will continue our journey looking at the specific parts of the Mass and what they say to us, the Bride. And stay with us on Journeys of Hope. You're on the everyday journey of life, and sometimes it's tough to keep hope alive. Well, that's why Pilgrim Center of Hope is here for you. Not only does Pilgrim Center of Hope provide you programs like Journeys of Hope, but did you know you can also find other helpful media productions from Pilgrim Center of Hope on our website, pilgrimcenterofhope.org. Every first Friday, take an audio retreat with Jesus called Meet the Master. Every third Thursday, have a social with the saints and our new series, Who is the Man of the Shroud? meets at the intersection of faith, true crime, science and medicine, history, art, and much more. Find it all at pilgrimcenterofhope.org or on your favorite podcast app. And keep hope alive in your daily journey. Pilgrim Center of Hope, guiding people to Christ. Welcome back to Journeys of Hope. Our journey today is a spiritual pilgrimage through the Catholic Mass. In the first segment, we learned about Christ's identity as the bridegroom, showing God's immense love for us and how that is expressed in scripture and history. Now we're going to look at our lived experience of this in the Roman Catholic Mass. How are we participating in a wedding banquet every time we go to Mass? Well, one of the first things we do when we enter a Catholic church is to sign ourselves with holy water, making the sign of the cross over ourselves. If your church's baptismal font has a feature which keeps the water flowing or moving, that is not just for aesthetic purposes, but it harkens back to the Jewish mikvah, or living waters, in other words, moving waters. In our last segment, we discussed the Jewish mikvah, the living waters, which were used to purify oneself prior to getting married. So did you know this relates to our baptism and confirmation when Jesus bathed us as a bride in the living water of the Holy Spirit and poured out his gifts on us? When we enter a church, a Catholic church, and sign ourselves with the sign of the cross using holy water, we are reminding ourselves of our identity as God's beloved, and we are preparing ourselves for our spiritual wedding, anticipating our union with the bridegroom. In fact, the holy water font of our church actually symbolizes the womb of a mother. Did you know that? A beautiful sign of the fruitfulness of Christ's marriage to the church, who is our mother, is seen during 
in particular the Easter Vigil Mass, but we have a reminder of it throughout the year. Okay, Angela, what are you talking about? Well, it's the Easter candle, that tall white candle always present in the church that is formally called the Paschal Candle. During the Easter Vigil Mass, this tall candle is intentionally plunged into the waters of the baptismal pool to bless the waters. And Father Matthew Hawkins of the Orlando Diocese writes, quote, When the water in the baptismal font is blessed, the Paschal candle is plunged three times. In some Eastern traditions, wax is dripped into the water, offering even further, even richer symbolism of insemination. From this now fertile womb, new Christians will be born into the family of God. Unquote. This symbolism reminds me of the beauty of the church as my spiritual family and my home. When I attend the Easter Vigil Mass and witness this rite occur and then see people emerging from that blessed font as new Christians, new members of our spiritual family, I just can't help but cry. It's like witnessing a new birth. So the next time that you sign yourself with holy water from the font, I hope that you'll remember at least some of this very rich symbolism and how much you are loved. Now, let's talk about the formal Mass itself. The first act in the Roman Catholic Mass is typically a procession with lit candles toward the altar. Now, do you remember processions in the Gospel stories of Jesus? In the Gospel according to Matthew, Jesus tells the story of 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. The five wise virgins who kept oil for their lamps were able to join the wedding procession. And this is in correlation with the Jewish tradition of the taking of the bride at night by lamplit procession. What would happen? What am I talking about? Well, a refresher from our last segment. The groom and his groomsmen would come at night to take the bride to his father's house where he had prepared a place for her to join him in their new life together. So for us, when Mass begins, maybe we feel like we've been living in a dark night as we see the procession of lit candles with the crucifix at its head. We have hope as Jesus the Bridegroom is arriving to bring us to his Father's house so that we can begin our new life with him. This procession reaches the sanctuary, which is properly the term that only refers to the area around the altar. This sanctuary area is typically raised higher than the rest of the church floor because the sanctuary or holy place symbolizes Jerusalem having a higher elevation, which I clearly remember when I visited Jerusalem and those steep climbs that we would sometimes make. The height of the sanctuary also symbolizes the new Jerusalem or heaven, the Father's house, which is the dwelling of, yes, our Father, the place where Jesus has gone to prepare that place for us, his bride. And as he said at the Last Supper, in my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. I am going there to prepare a place for you. I will come back and take you to myself so that where I am, you also may be. And that is from John 14. The presider of the Mass upon arriving at the altar will kiss it. This kiss is a kiss on behalf of us, the bride, to Christ, the bridegroom, who is represented by the altar. Did you know the altar represents Christ? in his priestly sacrifice, lovingly offering himself as a sacrifice on the cross, as we mentioned previously. The presider then moves to the chair, which represents Christ in his kingship. This is where he leads us to begin with the sign of the cross, greets us, and in some cases, a rite of sprinkling of holy water reminds us once again of our purification as prior to a wedding and of our baptism. As we continue this pilgrimage through the Mass, let us consider the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians once again. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and handed himself over for her to sanctify her, cleansing her by the bath of water. And by this point in the Mass, we have experienced water. Paul says Christ does this also with the word. 
that he might present to himself the church in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. So after the rite of sprinkling, we make an act of penitence, which is also part of that purification process. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned. And we ask for mercy. Lord, have mercy. In Greek, Kyrie eleison. On most Sundays and on feast days, we continue by singing the Gloria, which is the song of the angels at the birth of Jesus. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to people of goodwill. This outcry of our singing mirrors how the author of the book of Revelation describes, quote, I heard a sound from heaven like the sound of rushing water or a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps. They were singing what seemed to be a new hymn before the throne. No one could learn this hymn except the 144,000 who had been ransomed from the earth. And these are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They have been ransomed as the first fruits of the human race for God and the Lamb. Well, after we finish singing the Gloria, the presider prays on behalf of all in a prayer called the Collect. Then we sit as a sign of listening of someone who is being taught because we're about to listen to the word of God. Remember, St. Paul wrote that Christ cleansed his church not only through a bath of water, but also with the word. And so we listen to the word, which, as we have heard, is to listen to the love story between God and humanity, a story of God's faithfulness to us. We're not only listening, but we're also responding through the praying of the psalm after the first reading. The psalm response invites us into this dialogue with God. Typically on Sundays or feast days, a second reading is proclaimed. All of these readings are proclaimed from the ambo, which is the third major piece of symbolic furnishing in the church. The ambo, which looks like a fancy podium maybe to our modern eyes, represents Christ the prophet going out to meet his bride. This is why often the ambos in some churches are built in a style that sort of juts out into the congregation. Now we hear the gospel acclamation, Alleluia, Alleluia, and we stand up. I cannot help but connect this to the wedding procession described earlier. During the ancient wedding procession at nighttime, the guests would have been sitting on the streets waiting for the bridegroom's arrival, perhaps exchanging stories with one another. The bridegroom's arrival would be announced with a loud cry. Imagine the wedding guests rising upon hearing that cry. So here at Mass, we have this gospel acclamation that is sung. And meanwhile, the deacon or priest processes with the book of the gospel, ideally accompanied by altar servers holding candles, again, reminding us of the groom's nighttime arrival, and that the word of God is, as scripture says, a lamp to our feet and a light for our path. That Christ is our light. So much symbolism. Not only do we walk in darkness, um, or no longer, I should say, do we walk in darkness, but with Christ, our path is lit. Before the good news is proclaimed to us, we once again give praise and sign our mind, lips, and heart with the sign of the cross, an indication that we want to take this good news into ourselves and become one with our bridegroom. After giving praise for the gospel news, the good news that we've heard, the deacon or priest or bishop will kiss the book of the gospel. Then we sit during the homily as we continue to be fed with spiritual food. The homily is not simply a sermon. The homily explains the scriptures we've just heard, which are what Catholics around the world have heard that day, and it applies these readings into our daily lives. This is a practice also continuing from the Jewish tradition. Now, in today's language, you might consider the first half of this Mass, called the Liturgy of the Word, as an exchange of vows between the bridegroom, Jesus, and the bride, his church. Because after the homily, we stand and we profess our faith. Now, let's talk about that word. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, and so on, the Nicene Creed. The word believe 
doesn't only mean I'm pretty sure about or I have an intellectual assent to. I believe in means I trust in. In Spanish, we say confío, deriving from the fact that we have confidence in our beloved Lord and in our mother, the church. Now, we have come to the part of the Mass called the Prayer of the Faithful, in which we petition God for our needs. And well, what strong marriage or family doesn't also include a similar sharing between loved ones? We are seated now, and the altar is prepared. Except on Holy Saturday, the altar is always covered with a white cloth. Did you know this? Even when other liturgical colors will lay over it, there's always a white cloth underneath. This white garment may itself remind us of a wedding, but it is also a reminder of when Jesus' body was wrapped in a new linen garment and entered the tomb. And Jesus emerged on Easter Sunday morning as a Jewish wedding celebrated the new marriage for seven days feast. So we celebrate the Easter season for seven weeks of seven days, plus one day, 50 days, the ultimate feast for the ultimate wedding. That's your wedding, the humanity's wedding with God. Now, in many churches, the altar has a four pillared structure built over it called a baldacchino which also represents the Jewish chuppah. Rabbi Maurice Lamb explains this. Chuppah symbolizes the groom's home and the bride's new domain. More specifically, the chuppah symbolizes the bridal chamber where the marital act was consummated in ancient times. So, wow, have you ever realized all of this symbolism in the mass in a Catholic church? Think of how the table is set for a wedding banquet. Well, at every Mass, fine linens and vessels are also present for our meal. The cup, called a chalice, may be simple or ornate in design, but must be made of precious material. The small, flat plate, ordinarily placed on top of the chalice, called a paten, is where the priest places at least the large altar bread to be received as communion by him. Usually at your parish, the altar breads that are consecrated for the larger congregation to receive as Holy Communion are held in a larger bowl or cup with a cover or lid called a ciborium. As the altar is prepared for the meal, we have a collection and an offering of gifts brought forth from the community. These are some of the most ancient parts of the Mass, which even Justin Martyr, who lived in the 100s AD, wrote about. This part of the Mass is a sign of our love as Christians in that we take care of one another and we offer back of what we have been given by God to God and to our community. And of course, what wedding doesn't include gifts? (laughs) The presider washes his hands as the purification ceremony before entering into the prayers of communion. He prays over the gifts and invites all of us, lift up your hearts. We respond, We lift them up to the Lord. At this moment, the church offers our hearts to the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. Now the Sanctus, in which we cry, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of hosts. This reminds us that we are witnessing a moment when heaven touches earth. As the author of the book of Revelation tells us about his vision of heaven, Day and night, they do not stop exclaiming, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. This part of the Mass also reminds us of when Jesus was entering into Jerusalem before his passion, riding on a donkey. And the people cried out, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Well, Jesus is coming to meet us. Jesus is coming to this place which we have raised up the sanctuary, this place representing Jerusalem. Jesus is now coming to us here. Let's talk more about that. The Eucharistic prayer is closely related to the Jewish tradition of the Seder meal because, of course, it was that Passover meal Jesus celebrated with the apostles before his death. There are many elements to a Passover meal, but interestingly, in the gospel accounts of the Last Supper, only two elements in the meal are explicitly named, bread and wine. 
Now, do you remember how the ancient Jewish marital tradition had the bride and groom drinking from a cup of wine as a sign of their covenant? Let's discuss wine. Jesus turned water into wine at the wedding at Cana. Why is wine so significant in this story? Father Romano Gardini writes in his book, Sacred Signs, quote, Wine that maketh glad the heart of man is the biblical expression. The purpose of wine is not only to quench thirst, but also to give pleasure and satisfaction and exhilaration. The psalmist wrote, my cup, how goodly it is, how plenteous, literally how intoxicating, though not in the sense of drinking to excess. Wine possesses a sparkle, a perfume, a vigor that expands and clears the imagination. Under the form of wine, Christ gives us his divine blood. It is no plain and sober draught. It was bought at a great price, at a divinely excessive price. Blood of Christ inebriate me, says St. Ignatius. Unquote. Well, Father Gordini is speaking about wine used at the final Passover meal that Jesus shared with his disciples, which every presider at every Mass repeats, in which he took the chalice of wine, and in the earliest gospel, as recorded by Mark, gave thanks and gave it to them, and they all drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which will be shed for many. Amen, I say to you, I shall not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. For millennia ever since, Christians have celebrated that sacred sign, as Paul instructed the Corinthian church, saying, Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily will have to answer for the body and blood of the Lord. Unquote. So the significance of this wine then is not only of a wedding and not only a symbol of communion with one another or with Christ, but is so significant and serious that whoever drinks it unworthily in the early church's celebrations, according to Paul, has to answer for it. This is because of the ancient Christian belief, which is still maintained by Catholic and Orthodox churches, that during the Mass or Divine Liturgy, a priest consecrates the chalice of wine using the words of Christ. And when that happens, the wine retains the appearances and physical characteristics of wine, but its substance becomes the very blood of Christ. And when the altar bread is likewise consecrated, it retains the appearances and physical characteristics of bread, but its substance becomes the body of Christ. In, go- in John's gospel, it's, it's not long after his encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well that Jesus insists in chapter 6, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger. And whoever believes in me will never thirst. Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day, for my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I have life because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. Many who heard this left and no longer followed Jesus, and he did not stop them or give clarification to his teaching. Holy Communion is a taste of the marriage banquet in heaven because it is truly Jesus who instituted this meal, who offers us his life through his own body and blood in the miracle of Holy Communion. One of my favorite lines from the Eucharistic prayer during Mass is when the priest says, Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life, and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. 
God has held us worthy. No matter how wayward and unfaithful we may be, God has held us worthy. God thinks so highly of you that he has orchestrated all that we've been talking about to show you that you are loved beyond measure. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. Love is not pompous. It is not inflated. It is not rude. It does not seek its own interests. It is not quick-tempered. It does not brood over injury. It does not rejoice over wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Following the Eucharistic prayer, we all join together in praying the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, known as the Our Father. St. Augustine writes that we can understand the words, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, to mean in the church as in our Lord Jesus Christ himself, or in the bride who has been betrothed, just as in the bridegroom who has accomplished the will of the Father. In other words, we pray that our will would become one with Christ's will, since he is one with the Father. And following the prayers for peace and the sign of peace, which was originally called the kiss of peace in the ancient church, we call on Jesus as the Lamb of God, in Latin, Agnus Dei, for peace and mercy. Then, the priest declares, like St. John the Baptist, who called himself the best man, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are those called to the supper of the Lamb. The second part of those words are from the book of Revelation, which says, Then the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who have been called to the wedding feast of the Lamb. And he said to me, These words are true. They come from God. At this time, we the bride, process to the altar to be joined with the bridegroom in Holy Communion. Volumes more could be shared about wedding and marital imagery in the Mass, but we come to the end of today's pilgrimage. So now, how will you participate in Mass differently? And very importantly, how will you choose to live differently? This brings us to our jewel for the journey. As is our tradition, we want to give you a jewel for the journey, a spiritual gem that you can reflect on throughout the week. And this week we reflect on a verse from the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verse 9, which says, Blessed are those who have been called to the wedding feast of the Lamb. How blessed we are. We pray together in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God, we thank you so much for your love. We love you. We ask you for the grace to live according to that love, to live according to the knowledge that we are so beloved by you. We ask this grace through Christ, our bridegroom and our Lord. Amen. We invite you to come to Pilgrim Center of Hope Friends and learn more about our threefold ministry of pilgrimages, conferences, and media production outreach. We are a nonprofit ministry. Join us in this vital mission of evangelization as we guide people to Christ and the church. Learn more at pilgrimcenterofhope.org or call us at 210-521-3377. That's pilgrimcenterofhope.org or call us at 210-521-3377. We would love to hear from you about your feedback on this program. Please let us know how it impacted you. And please feel free to share the link with your friends and family, with your fellow parishioners, with uh, folks maybe who need to know how much they are loved. Fellow pilgrims, let us strive to live each day with love, faith, courage, and hope. As we continue in our journey of hope, we pray that certainly you will know how loved you are, how, how blessed you are, and how blessed we are as God's people, as God's bride, 
to be so loved, to have so many signs that we are loved and to remind ourselves of those signs every day. Every hour of every day, this beloved wedding feast takes place for you, for me, and for everyone who has ever and will ever live. Until next time, God bless you. Safe travels.